Welcome to Texas A&M College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs Continuing Video Conference Series. Today, Dr. Blue McClendon will be talking to us about our wild health. She'll discuss the benefits that wildlife has to humans and how humans can help protect wildlife. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. McClendon, welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. I'm going to talk about the best subject today, which is wildlife, and I'll talk a little bit about wildlife health and how you can be impacted by wildlife health. But because I've never spoken to you before, it's always good for you to know something about your instructor. So what I want you to know about me is that I am a veterinarian at, the, at Texas A&M University. I'm at the College of Veterinary Medicine. And I'm the director at one of the best places on campus, which is the Winnie Carter Wildlife Center. It's named after this really amazing woman who was named Winnie Carter. I teach undergraduate students and I teach veterinary students, and it's one of the best things that I do. But the absolute best thing that I do is I get to lead a study abroad trip for veterinary students to South Africa every year. And if you ever get the chance to travel to other countries to see the animals in other countries, you should do so. And another thing that you should know about me is my favorite animal, which is, in case you haven't guessed based upon what I have on today, it is elephants because they are the smartest animal. Okay, I think they're the smartest animal. And they have a trunk that is used to drink with, eat with, and they say hi to their friend with their trunk, or they might raise their trunk because they're angry, but it's just an amazing appendage with lots of muscle. So I just love elephants, and I love everything about them. So enough about me. Well, I want to talk about wildlife today, and by the way, I did bring a couple of animals to show you, so I'm not going to show them to you yet because I want to be sure that you're paying close attention to what I'm talking about today. The definition of wildlife is any non-domestic animal that is native to a country. It's got to be native. It's got to be indigenous. It's got to naturally occur in the area. And wildlife are the most interesting of animals. You know, we see dogs and we see cats, but it's the non-domestic things, the things that you don't normally bring into your house that I think are the most interesting of animals. So wildlife would be, in the slide right now, what you see is an Atwater prairie chicken, and it is native to Texas. It's, a, it's considered an endangered species because the numbers of them is decli are declining. But you all probably see wildlife every day. You probably see what? You probably see cottontail rabbits, and you see squirrel. And maybe you see skunks, which if you do during the day is bad. You may see raccoons but you also see all kinds of wild birds. So you're surrounded by wildlife. So I wanna talk a little bit about wildlife health. So the next thing I wanna talk about then is uh, one of our common wildlife species in Texas, which is our white-tailed deer. We have huge populations of white-tailed deer. And I actually do have white-tailed deer at the wildlife center where I work, but I have no fawns because it's not fawning season. And I don't think that any deer would really like to come and uh, be in this studio to, to see you today. I'm sorry, but they just don't lend themselves well to that, that kind of uh, activity. Most of, a lot of you probably know about hunting, and if you were here, I would like you to raise your hands and tell me, or you could raise your hands, because I can see some of you. How many of you know someone who goes deer hunting? Anybody? Deer hunting, no? Okay, I see one person. So lots of people do hunt deer in Texas, and it really is something that's necessary to control populations because we do have huge populations. But we're surrounded by deer. Some of you probably see them almost every day. And there's a lot of breeding programs in this state where people have deer in captivity to try to improve the genetics. And that beautiful picture that you see on my slide right now are a couple of deer that live at the Wildlife Center. And that's when they're fawns. That is actually Buck and Heath that are about 12 years old now that are gonna live to be little old deer men, as I say. Now, an, an exotic animal is a non-domestic animal that is not native to our country. So I did bring an animal today, which you're not gonna get to see just yet, 
that is a tortoise species that's native to Africa. And then I brought a tortoise species that's native to Texas. So the definition of an exotic animal is something not domesticated, which means it's not used to being raised by humans, that is not native to the country. So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. So an elephant is an exotic animal it, when you're in this country. But when I go to South Africa, elephants are wildlife. And to me, that just seems so unusual. But when I go to South Africa and I work with the veterinarian there, that is a wildlife veterinarian working on elephants. White-tailed deer are, you're probably thinking, what is a white-tailed deer? Is it wildlife or is it exotic? Well, for those of you, because you're I don't know, I follow here in Texas, but if, since you're in the United States, white-tailed deer is wildlife. But if you took white-tailed deer and you, were, you took it to somewhere like England or Spain, that would be considered to be an exotic animal. And then house sparrows, which are not one of my favorite things, are considered to be, uh, they're an exotic animal. They're actually an invasive species that were brought over probably on ships from England because they're actually the English house sparrow. And they're not my favorite bird because they try to take over the habitat of the purple martins, because I have some of those purple martin houses in my backyard. And house sparrows will make nests inside the purple martin houses. And the purple martin is wildlife. And I'm sure some of you can think of some other things. Cottontail rabbits are native to this country. Or things like ocelots, which are an exotic cat, are wildlife because they're native to Texas, and native to Mexico. Some of the human benefits of wildlife, hopefully some of you benefit from exposure to wildlife. There's environmental health because wildlife play a whole role in the ecosystem. Um, they are indigenous animals, they're part of the habitat in which we live, we expect them to always be there. We expect them to sort of be part of the whole order of, of life and part of the food chain, if you will, even if we don't like that. We also benefit from doing research with wildlife, whether it's human interactions with wildlife or studying wildlife diseases, because wildlife do get some pretty important diseases, some of which can be transmitted to livestock and some of which can be transmitted to humans. And then obviously they can be transmitted to each other. And nutrient recycling, that's a good and a bad thing, because what do birds do? Birds go to certain places to eat the seeds from certain trees and plants, and then they go and fly to other areas and spread those seeds around. That can be, again, a good thing and a bad thing. Because some of the seeds, for example, can bring non-native tree species to other areas where we really don't want them. Oh, again, I already talked about seed dispersal. But a lot of uh, wildlife animals do play an important role in, in populations. And, and pollination, rather. And then recreation. We like to go and look at wildlife. We like to see them in their native habitats. You know, some people may not necessarily like to see white-tailed deer come to their backyard and eat their shrubs and eat their roses and eat their ornamental plants that they spend a lot of time growing. But other people like that. It apparently is a huge problem in the Austin area where some people will actually feed the white-tailed deer and encourage them to come to their backyard, but other people are putting up electric fences to keep them out. So, you know, it depends on, um, the benefit sometimes depends upon your perspective and where you live. We do know that there's a lot of human wildlife conflicts, and some of you maybe have experienced these conflicts in your own uh, life, in your own backyard, because if you look at this slide, everyone hopefully recognizes that as raccoons. And that is a family of raccoons probably enjoying someone's dog food that they put out in their backyard to feed their animals free choice, which is an okay thing to do. But the problem is, as you see in this picture, the raccoons are obviously repopulating the area very well and putting out that dog food is encouraging them to come to the area. Raccoons carry, probably most of you know what disease they carry. So in your own classroom, you should take a couple of seconds and discuss what disease do raccoons carry? And tell your teacher what, what disease they carry. Hopefully, most of you realize that it's rabies. 
they are they cured rabies. It's really not a good thing to get rabies. If you get rabies as a human and you are unvaccinated, it is going to kill you. So you want to avoid raccoons. Raccoons also carry an important parasite that is just, it lives inside the intestines of the raccoon. And it doesn't really do the raccoon much harm. But if that disease, it's a big word. You ready? It's a huge word. It's called Bayless Ascaris Procyonis. And it is an intestinal parasite of raccoons. And if it gets into humans, it can get to your brain. And obviously, the human brain is not meant to live with worms inside of it, and so it will kill you. So you don't ever want to be in around an area where there are raccoons. Because raccoons are just kind of going to defecate or poop wherever they want to. And so you know when your mother tells you to wash your hands all the time, especially after you went to a park, it's really important because there could have been something like a raccoon there that was doing his business and left some parasite eggs there which you got on your hands which then if you touch your your uh, mouth you can ingest those accidentally um, there's other conflicts in that um, probably some of you know people who have accidentally been hit by a white-tailed deer at night which can be very hazardous especially if you're on a motorcycle very hazardous uh, what other kind of human wildlife conflicts? Some of you may have known maybe people that got raccoons in their attic, and that's a huge problem, or people that have gotten skunks living under their house. And that is a problem from several, for several reasons, not just because they stink, but also because, again, they carry rabies and they carry that, pro, that Bayless Ascaris parasite, which is a huge problem. All right, other things about uh, conflict. I talked a little bit about injury. Uh, death, again, we do see diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans. Those are called zoonotic diseases. Um, health hazards from intestinal parasitism, which means you got the parasite from the animal and it went through an abnormal migration where, where you got it in your mouth, it went through your intestinal tract and maybe got into an abnormal place and can cause some serious injury. Also, some animals can cause some substantial crop or property damage. Now, if we lived in Africa, where elephants roam free in some areas, those animals do huge damage to crops. And an elephant can eat three to 500 pounds of forage in a day. So can you imagine if an elephant gets into someone's crop in their field, how much damage they can do in a very short period of time. And elephants, except for the fe except for the, the uh, males, run in, in family groups, and so they can do a lot of damage. White-tailed deer probably do some crop damage in some areas, but one animal that's in Texas that actually is considered an exotic, non-native animal are feral hogs or feral pigs. And those are pigs that, that started probably from an exotic pig breed that was brought over here, probably Russian Moors. They probably bred with domestic animals, domestic pigs, and they created these things we call feral hogs. And they do huge damage to fields, to golf courses, to parks, to your yard. They're just indiscriminate about, about where they do the damage. And they don't do it on purpose. They do it because they're looking for food and they're digging into, uh, looking for roots and what have you and they reproduce very well. So it's an area of research trying to figure out how to control the populations of those feral pigs in a humane manner. And then um, habitat destruction is, we could talk about that for the rest of the afternoon really. Habitat destruction has to do with areas where, for, for me I think of it as an area where humans are destroying the habitat where the animals used to live and it can cause huge problems with the populations of those animals. You know, habitat destruction also is what I was talking about a second ago with feral hogs, where the hogs get into the areas and destroy the human habitats. But we do see a huge problem where humans are destroying the habitats of animals. It causes conflicts in the state because we have some areas where there are certain bird species that are on the protected species list, they're on the endangered species list. And so farmers, for example, are not allowed to change their, their, um, 
land much. People may not be able well, to cut down trees. For example, the black-capped vireo in the Austin area causes huge conflicts with people that are landowners that want to develop their land, but yet the people that want to protect the animals. So I think those are conflicts that will never go away that we will face forever, and you will face in your generation too. Now I want to take a little break and show you one of the animals that I brought today. If you don't mind, because it's just time for a little animal. Now, this is JJ, and you know, he's an animal, so he doesn't behave right. And this is a Sonoran Desert Tortoise. And you can see, hopefully, can y'all see that he is about the size of my hand? And he's two years old. I named him JJ after my friend and colleague who's a veterinarian. Her name is Jill, and her first initial is J. And I never know what that J means. But I like to name animals after people that I know. But when he hatched, he was only about this big. Maybe about the size of a golf ball. And he was hatched at the Wildlife Center from some animals that were confiscated from another state, from an adjoining state, because this, this animal is wildlife. And so you cannot just go into the wild and pick these animals up because these are protected. Just like you're not really supposed to go out and, and find a, like a cottontail rabbit and decide you wanna to try to make it a pet or find a pet, a baby squirrel and decide you wanna make it a pet. Because these are wildlife, there's all sorts of, of laws and regulations. But anyway, isn't it cute? So he's about the size of my hand, JJ. How big will he get? I'm gonna show you my other tortoise in a minute that is a wildlife species, that's an African species. And JJ, when he's full grown, will get about the size of the other animal. So we're gonna have a question and answer at the end of my talk, and you can ask me questions about this animal. But you will not be allowed to have one of these as a pet. Okay. Also, remember that he is He's a tortoise. Now, why do we call him a tortoise? You thinking, why do I call him a tortoise and not a turtle? He's a tortoise because he's a land, what we call Shalonian. So the group of turtles, turtles and tortoises, are in this category of animals called Shalonians. It starts with a CH, and you can look that up after my talk. And in this country, we call land turtles tortoises. So if you find one of these, you got to look at him carefully. Don't put him in water, he'll drown. See his feet? He looks kind of like a prehistoric creature, don't you think? Can y'all see him good? I think he looks like a little dinosaur. Look at him. Oh, see him? He looks like a little dinosaur. See he has no webs on his feet? He cannot swim. No swimming, see? No webs. If you put him in a pond, drop him in there, he'll drown. Okay? So that's JJ. All right, disease transmission. Uh, I jumped the gun and talked a little bit about diseases, but always consider that really any animal can give you diseases. And I understand that you already had a talk about some of the diseases that even domestic animals can give you. But when you're dealing with non-domestic animals, there's, there's an even bigger risk of disease. Now, why is that? Well, it's because our wildlife are not vaccinated for anything, right? Wildlife are out there just running around doing their wildlife thing, and they're not vaccinated for, for any sort of diseases. They're not vaccinated for distemper, like you would vaccinate your dog. And so we see distemper in raccoons, for example. Um, there's other diseases like rabies that we talked about. Some animals can live with rabies and not show any signs of being rabid, as we call it. And so even though you look at the animal and you think it doesn't look diseased, things like foxes and raccoons can have rabies in their system for more than 30 days and have no outward clinical signs. So you do need to remember to avoid wildlife animals when you when you're out there look at them from a distance but don't try to approach them also we humans so 
Rabies is an example of a disease called a zoonotic disease. It looks like some people might say zoonotic. I say a zoonotic disease. So it's a disease that humans can get from animals. Now my slide says that humans get it from wildlife, but if, if you get a disease from your dog, you're gonna say your dog got rabies from a raccoon, and then the dog gets the rabies to you, it's still a zoonotic disease. Now in the picture, hopefully you recognize that as an armadillo. Hopefully some of you have seen armadillos not just upside down, dead on the side of the road. Because armadillos are very interesting animals. People who come to Texas from other states usually have never seen an armadillo. Um, but they do carry a zoonotic disease. They are known to carry leprosy, which can be transmitted to humans. So again, another reason to avoid an armadillo. Armadillos actually make me personally a little bit mad because I, ha I get them in my yard and I'm a big gardener and they indiscriminately dig these huge holes in your flower bed because they're looking for a place to burrow at night and it's just when you're a gardener and you, you, know, you care about what's going on in your yard, it's not a good thing. So what you have to try to do is to trap the armadillo in a live trap, which means it's a little trap that the armadillo goes into it doesn't cause any harm to the armadillo, and then you carry the armadillo to another place, not to someone else's property, because that's not very nice, but maybe take it out to a field somewhere and let it go in a different area. Okay, wildlife is pets. Now, wildlife, again, you, sh you shouldn't really go out and just get wildlife as a pet, because one, there's regulations that say you cannot do that. There's a few exceptions to the rule. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you that as a child, I did not have wildlife as pets, because I did. Because my mother allowed me to. Uh, as, a, as a kid, my mother allowed me to have anything in my room, my bedroom, that she did not have to take care of, and that she could not smell from downstairs, and that didn't make big messes, and it had to be in a cage. So I had all kinds of things as a kid. Should I have? Probably not. And in retrospect, um, I wouldn't let my children have things like squirrels and raccoons. I mean, not raccoons, but squirrels and chipmunks in a cage in their room either. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of things do require specialized care. And one of, the, one of the things that wildlife requires is exercise. And so is it, it's not really fair to take an animal that's been living in the wild and just put it in a cage. But there's, there's some exceptions to that. If you are going to raise, if you find some sort of orphan animal and you want to raise it until it can be released, that is an okay thing to do. Again, a lot of that comes under regulations. So you may need to really call Texas Parks and Wildlife or obviously you all are the, of the computer generation, just get online and go to the Texas Parks and Wildlife um, website and look and see what the regulations are. And certain animals, you need to get them to rehabilitators. Because even though you can read about how to take care of certain wildlife, it's very hard to raise some of those animals. Because they do require specialized care, such as special diets, special sorts of environments, especially reptiles require heat as a, as a source, and then especially light requirements. So you don't wanna go get something in the wild, put it in a cage in your bedroom, with the lights off while you're in school all day. And yes, if your teacher would let you bring the animal to school, that would be great, but that's probably not gonna happen. Um, some wildlife can be very aggressive and very unpredictable. So if you take, for example, I don't think anyone should ever raise a baby raccoon, period. You shouldn't do it. The risk for rabies is entirely too high. But for example, a baby squirrel. Sometimes people do find them because maybe someone cut down a tree and the squirrels fell out of the tree. And so the kind thing to do is to be a good Samaritan and try to at least get the squirrel babies in a, uh, maybe a container where their mother can come and find them because 90% of the time, the mother will come back and get those animals. But if you do take them home and try to raise them, a lot of times they will become very aggressive and very unpredictable and they just don't make good pets. Captivity is very stressful. Can you imagine being a wild creature and someone suddenly taking you and putting you into the confines of a cage. 
I mean, how stressful would that be? And then again, zoonotic diseases. Remember what that is? Zoonotic diseases are the diseases that animals can give to you, some of which can be fatal. If you get rabies, you will not survive. Now, there's no picture associated with this slide on purpose, because I want you to remember that keeping a wild animal in captivity does not make it a pet. You may call it a pet, but it's not really truly a pet in the sense of, of what we think of as a pet dog or a pet cat. So moving on to another subject, let's talk a little bit about wildlife and research. There is a lot of uh, research that's done with wildlife. Again, we need to know how to prevent and treat some of those zoonotic diseases. An example of some excellent research with wildlife is the work that's done with the attempt to inoculate or more or less vaccinate some animals for rabies by dropping baits from airplanes and helicopters. It's a program that started about 15 years ago in South Texas mainly, and the attempt is to try to vaccinate things like uh, foxes and coyotes for rabies by dropping these, these baits that taste like food and try to get these animals to eat the baits to get them to be immunized against rabies. So then those animals, like the coyotes, don't spread it to domestic dogs and spread it to humans. But there was a lot of research that went on to try to start that program. The Winnie Carter Wildlife Center, where I work, was used as one of the research sites where we brought in some coyotes and fed them some of those baits to then follow up on them and see if they truly did develop what we call a tiger to rabies to see if they then, the baiting program would work. That's just one example of some of the research projects that are done. Also, an area of research is to understand the natural biology of animals. Because if we want to try to protect wildlife, if we have concerns about wildlife, we want to know how to manage them from a disease standpoint or to try to increase the populations, we need to understand their natural biology, which means how do they live? How do they raise their young? Where do they like to, to make their house? What do they eat? How do they reproduce? so that then we can then try to control that. For example, with feral hogs, they are such a problem in this state. We need to know about their, their family groups, and we need to know about their foraging, so that we can figure out maybe a system to introduce birth control to control their populations. Again, social behavior. Uh, I was involved in a research project a number of years ago using javelinas in the state of Texas, also called the white-collared peccary, that's its proper name. And we were looking at the social behavior of those animals in using them as a model for one of the endangered peccaries, which is a pig-like animal, that occurs in South America. And it was a very interesting project where we found out that the females of the species do not uh, tolerate any other females coming into their social group. And if any other females come into their social group and have babies, those females will kill the babies. Now that is an important thing to know. If you are gonna try to breed these endangered species in captivity in the, and then release them in the wild. So threats to wildlife health. There's lots of threats to the health of wildlife in, in this country and, and throughout the world. Uh, human mistakes such as oil spills, is of course a threat and that if you've been reading the news you know that there's a spill in the Gulf that just occurred this last week and that is certainly a threat to wildlife. Um, sometimes it's a very long-term threat. Diseases that we've, as we've talked about are always threats. Um, overpopulation of animals. Just for example white-tailed deer. Overpopulation of white-tailed deer themselves is a threat to the health of that species. Now that may seem odd to you, very odd to you that, that getting too many of those animals is a threat, but you know, if you look at what's called a population growth in animals, 
you will see that if an animal gets too populated, it will spread diseases faster. It will eat most of the vegetation that the animals need to be healthy. And so, you know, whether or not you like to hunt, hunting, for example, of white-tailed deer in the state of Texas is a very important thing to do because we have to control their populations. We've talked a little bit about habit, habitat distraction, uh, destruction and how that can cause diseases amongst animals. And then there's other problems as well. The picture is, uh, hopefully most of you realize that that is an oiled animal. So wildlife conservation, protecting our vanishing wildlife, I, I could talk about this all day. It's such an important thing to consider the whole ecosystem and how animals are important to, to our lives as humans. Um, anything you can do to get yourself involved with wildlife conservation is important. It's important to protect the Earth's biological diversity. So do what you can to help uh, wild animals, whether it's in your country or whether it's exotic animals in other countries. Black rhinos in, especially in South Africa, black and white rhinos are being poached at alarming rates. And if we don't do something about it, these animals are going to be extinct in your lifetime. For example, 1,000 rhinos in South Africa were poached, meaning they were killed illegally in a very inhumane manner. They were killed in 2013. And that's terrible. It's just terrible. What people are doing is killing rhinos for their horn. Because some people in some countries think that the horn has some sort of benefit medically, and it has absolutely no benefit to anyone. So people destroy the animal, kill the animal, cut off the horn, just try to benefit humans when it's really all fictitious that it even does anything to these animals. I've gotten to be involved with um, some projects in South Africa, and if you look on the, the picture on the left shows a white rhino who's actually, he's anesthetized, y'all. He got darted from a helicopter with some high potent drugs that made him go to sleep. And then the attempt is to get him into that trailer. Actually, that's what that is, is a metal compartment, a metal crate. And then the animal's gonna get transported to another area to try to populate a different area in South Africa. And in the bottom, you see where someone is drilling, like a Black and Decker drill. They're drilling out a hole into the horn of the rhino to put in a microchip so that if someone does poach the animal, they can figure out which animal that goes to. But that is one of the most amazing things that I've gotten to do as a wildlife veterinarian is to help with projects such as this. And of course, when the animal is sleeping, you gotta have your picture taken with it. Now, speaking of Africa, I wanna, I wanna break away from this slide talking about wildlife preservation, and I wanna show you the other animal that I brought today. And this animal that I brought is Al, and this is a beautiful tortoise. This is a African sulcata tortoise, also called a spur-thighed tortoise. And he's kind of hard for me to hold up because he weighs about 14 pounds. Is that not a beautiful face? Can you see it up close? They're gonna try to make it, you can see him up close. Look at him. I'm spatially impaired. Isn't he beautiful? Look how big he is. Now, this is an exotic animal because this is an African species. This animal was probably purchased by a boy. This animal actually came from the Houston SPCA a couple weeks ago. This was an owner surrender. And, and what often happens with these animals is that people buy them when they are tiny, like the size of a quarter maybe. It's a little tiny, maybe a couple inches across. But you could buy one of these in a pet store because this is an exotic animal. This is not a native species, so there's no regulations on it because it's not endangered. And what happens is that these animals grow and grow, and this is the third largest tortoise in the world. This animal will get to be 150 pounds. So can you imagine trying to lug this guy in your house when it's winter and you have to get him in a warm place? And he's trying to back out of the camera. And, um, but he lives at the Wildlife Center. We're so happy to have him. But is that not a prehistoric creature? Okay, now, look at his feet. Is he a turtle or a tortoise? He is a tortoise. See his cool scales on his legs? And his spurs are not well developed in the back. They're kind of small back here. You kind of see him. Um, 
right there. He has these little spurs, so that's also why he's called a spur thigh tortoise. But look them up, they're called a sulcata. We have uh, two other large ones at the Wildlife Center. Actually, if you can go out for a second, I will show you the difference in the size of my two guests today. Here we go. Let me see if I can hold them up. Okay, there's Al, and there is JJ. Cute, huh? So this is my little wildlife creature, my desert tortoise. And you can't have that as a pet. And don't give one of these as a pet, okay? They get too big. But JJ probably will get almost this big. Not quite. All right. Now, do we have time to show our video? Yes. Okay, we are going to show you a video of the Wildlife Center. I um, am the veterinarian at the Wildlife Center, like I told you. And we have a little video to show you, to show you some of the things that our students do. So if you get so lucky as to come to Texas A&M University, you can become one of my students at the Wildlife Center. So here's our video. enjoyed that little uh, video for the Wildlife Center. The music's kind of silly, but um, we like it because, you know, it's, we don't think we'll offend anybody, and we think it'll cross the generations with the music. All right, if you go to the Winnie Carter slide, okay. Okay, so Winnie Carter, um, Wildlife Center is a great place. If you want to, you could go and like our Facebook page, and we do have a Facebook page. Um, and since there's so many of you watching today, I actually am going to try to update it to, so that you can see some of our newer animals, because we have some I haven't put on there, but, you know, I think if more people are on there liking it, I think it will encourage me to, um, to update it more often. But again, we're, we're a teaching and research facility. We um, teach a lot of students about management of animals. We, we teach a lot of students that want to be veterinarians, so they get a good understanding of the husbandry, which means the care of exotic animals when they're in captivity. Now, before we end and start to uh, question and answer, I just want to tell you that uh, wildlife are, import are important to me, not only at work, but also at home. So you can see this picture of little mallard ducks. My husband and I feed about 28, quote, pets that live in on the lake in our backyard every day. And there was a little hen that had eggs right next to our driveway. And those are her little chicks on the left. And I put a dog water bowl so they could learn to take their first bath. Because their mother, their mother doesn't take them to the lake until they're a couple of days old. And so I thought I'd give them a little water. And sure enough, they decided they could swim in the dog water bowl just fine. 
And it's very interesting when you live on a small lake or pond because some very unusual creatures, uh, unusual wildlife will come, and that those are white pelicans that decided to land in the lake. We have no idea why. It's not normal for them to be that far inland, but uh, it's just a special treat when you are able to have something in your yard that lures wildlife to come and visit you. For me, it just you know it enriches and enhances my life. So I think we are ready for questions. Yes. Hopefully, some of you will recognize one that that is me, and that two that is the water fountain at the Houston Zoo, which I have been drinking from my entire life. And you are never too old to drink from the Lion Water Fountain. We have a question. Go ahead. Okay. How many years do you have to be in college to be a veterinarian? Okay, the question how is how many years? How many years do you have to be in college to be a veterinarian? Well, the short answer is a long time, but you have to go to college for at least three years, most often four years, before you then start veterinary college. And then once you're in veterinary, co veterinary college, it's four years. So the minimum is seven years of college, but most people it's more like eight. It's almost the same as to be a human doctor, except with human doctors, they have to do a little extra education after they get out of medical school. <laughs> okay. Yes, we have another question Great. from Danella. What do you do if you have a wild animal and you don't want to give it away? Is that what you're saying, Danella? To the wildlife. Okay, so you got if you've got a wild, say you've got a baby animal and you raised it and you don't want to let it go when it's an adult. Well, sometimes even if you don't want to let it go, it's just the right thing to do, and it's just. You have to let your heart suffer and say, I'm just going to be sad. And you have to do the right thing for the animal, which is to let it go. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Hey, any more questions? We have a question from Gallego Elementary. Okay. I'm a from Gallego I'm going to ask you, why does the turtle have bumps in their shells? Oh, why does the turtle have bumps on his shells? Okay, well, this turtle, that, that's a great question. This turtle has a little bit of bumps on his shell. It's called pyramiding, pyramiding like pyramids, because it kind of comes to a little bit of a peak. And this animal should not have this, uh, these bumps on his shell. So your observation is excellent. His shell should be more like this, skew, what's called the skew right here. Probably he was fed too much protein when he was young. So a lot of times people, when they get these animals as pets, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put him down because he, he weighs a lot. Or I can put him down here. Sometimes people don't give him the right diet and they just buy turtle food and turtle food is not all the same. So you need to, you need to really read up when you're going to get a non-domestic animal. Because you can't go to the store and just buy tortoise chow. And so probably someone just fed him the improper diet. What this animal eats now is he eats mostly just vegetables and grass. Green leafy vegetables like spinach. And he loves it. Uh, we have one more question. Okay. How many? How many do they? How many years do they do they live for? Sulcatas. Uh, if you're talking about the sulcata, they can live to be about 150 years old. So you do not want to get one of these as a pet, because they will outlive you, and they get really huge. And they can't live outside in the winter, so you have to bring them in. And I'll tell you how we do it at the Wildlife Center when they're that big, because we have some big ones. We have students that put them on this sled-like device that we made. Looks like an upside-down giant frisbee. And they drag the animal on the sled into one of our stalls, 
where we have heat lamps and heat sources, but it would be hard for you to do that at your house. So if you want to get a turtle, there are some other species that only get, you know, about the size of, of uh, owl. All right, we're going to ask our email question, and this will be our last question for today's presentation. It says, other than the birds oiled up that we see on TV, what impact do oil spills, such as the one currently in the Galveston Channel, have on wildlife that inhabit these regions? Is there a real risk to the wildlife and fishery? Okay, oil spills are a terrible thing that happens. Um, usually, always, always by mistake, oftentimes by human error, almost always by human error. And what we see on TV and what we see online is we see the oiled birds, which is devastating to those animals. But what we don't see are the dead fish and the dead invertebrate organisms. And we don't see them because they're, they're underwater. So they're, it's not as dramatic. But oil spills affect a huge part of the food chain, the aquatic food chain, that then affects birds. Because what happens is that the oil will be ingested or coat some of the invertebrate animals that would then be eaten by the fish. And even if the fish weren't affected by the oil spill directly, if the fish don't even have oil on them, they're eating little invertebrate animals that either got coated by the oil or those animals consumed the oil, and then that kills the fish. And then what can happen is that some of the birds that maybe didn't even get affected by the oil directly ate the fish that got, direct, that got affected by the oil. So it can cause detrimental effects to all kinds of wildlife and aquatic life as well as plant life for years to come. All right, we thank you so much for joining us today about with our wildlife presentation. And we thank you, Dr. Blue McClendon, for joining us and presenting. If you'd like to learn more about wildlife, or veterinary science, or how science and veterinary science uh, work together, please visit our website at peer, P-E-E-R dot T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you next time.